presentations from the physics department. <coughs> These are Dr. Marksberger's students. She couldn't be with us here today, but I'm sure her two groups of students will make her proud. All right, so uh, I'm Sheldon Newman. This is Amanda Mason, and we presented all, or we did a study on triggers and messages in EKG. Uh, so a quick overview of what we did. Uh, we did computational analysis on research that Dr. Steinmetz performed. Um, so that involved labeling the data, filtering the data, and then finally analyzing the EKG signals for heart rate variability. So for the data collection portion, we uh, hooked up, or they, sorry, Dr. Steinmetz's researchers hooked up participants uh, to an EG and EKG simultaneously. And so uh, you can see here, um, uh, TJ here, hooked up to and the brain cap is the EEG right there that you see on his head and the EKG is kind of mostly under his shirt so it's hard to see but that involved the heart while EEG was the brain. Um, so these participants were shown uh, positive, neutral, and negative images and these are just some examples of what they might have seen. Um, and here's a timeline that kind of gives a representation of what they saw. So there were 96 total events and each event was shown for 9,000 milliseconds with a rest period of approximately 5,000 milliseconds before showing the next picture. And this went on for each event, on and on. And so that's kind of a uh, visual of uh, what they might have seen. Um, and so for the rest period, I, um, that involved looking at Navon figures, um, which is a large letter composed of smaller letters. So in this example here, you can see it's an H made of smaller Ts. Um, so after the collection, that's when we uh, exported the data and labeled it. So we created code that would label the data with a number according to the type of event. So the one, so we labeled it with a one if it was a negative picture, two if it was a neutral picture, three if it was a positive picture, and four if it was the rest. And these were colored accordingly. So here's an example of what that looks like. Um, the yellow is negative, the green is neutral, the red is positive, and the rest is black. So if we take this section right here and zoom in on it, you can kind of see it better. Um, and as I said earlier, each event is broken up by the rest periods and they're labeled red, green, or yellow. So after the labeling was done, we had to filter the data. And to do that, we used a modified Pan Tompkin filter code from Linkoping University. And this code removes the noise from the data as well as locates the high peaks. Um, so noise is caused by patient movement, such as blinking or fidgeting, mostly, uh, as well as some other things, but that's the main cause. And it has to be removed if you're going to analyze the data appropriately. Um, so this is an example of noise reduction. So on the bottom here, you can see this is the, e the ECG with, or EKG with noise. And then after you remove the noise, you can see it gets a lot smoother, and it looks like a, like a good signal that you can actually use. So after you, after you clean the data and filter the data, you can move on to analyzing the data. And Amanda did that portion. So hearts have an electrical system that controls the timing of your heartbeat. And it does this by sending electrical signals through conducting cells and then to the muscle cells that cause that contraction that pumps the blood flow. And the rate at which these electrical signals are sent correlates to your heartbeat. So what EKG is measuring is the electrical activation of the heart. So this is an example of an EKG signal, and you have the voltage, which is the electrical activation on the y-axis, and time across the x-axis. So the PQ, R, and S is the activation stage of the heart, and then there's the recovery stage in this T right here. And what we're looking at analyzing when we're looking at EKG signals is the interbeat interval, or the RR interval variability, which is the time it takes to go from one of these high R peaks to the next high R peak. Oh, I did the wrong thing. What did I do? <laughs> I again. That's I see. Thing just there you go. Yeah. Which one's the clicker? <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> so the main goal of this analysis was to take a signal and do a numerical analysis on a physical system and be able to categorize the patients into different categories. So like, if you have all these dots right here, some patients are going to be red and some are green. We're going to somehow assign a number to those and be able to determine whether they have trait one or trait two. So you can also think of this, there have been studies on congestive heart failure and a normal heart. So you will do a numerical analysis and the red would be, for example, congestive heart failure patients and then the green would be a healthy heart. So which of these two pictures, can someone tell me which one they think is the healthy heart, the top or the bottom? Bottom. Bottom. 
Okay, so interestingly, hearts are variable systems, and that variability corresponds to health. So the top is actually the healthy heart, which you wouldn't think. So this was a sleep study, and here you have people have sleep apnea, and then this is the healthy heart. So keeping that in mind, what we studied was called detrended fluctuation analysis, which is used to estimate correlations over time. So if you look here, this is a different graph from what you'd seen before with the time and the voltage. This is the heartbeat number and the length of that heartbeat. So if it wasn't a variable system, you would expect the heartbeat length to be the same all the way across. So this would be a straight line. But here you see that there are 0.8 seconds, 0.6 <coughs> seconds here. But what we see are there are correlations. So you wouldn't expect, because your body's a physiological system, and you can't handle a huge change really fast, you have slow changes. So you see, like, after 0.8 seconds, you would expect a heartbeat of a similar time, but not exactly the same. So you can also think of that as, like, a river flowing down a mountain where the river might split at some points, and it might start going east, but it's not if it was trending west, but it's not going to all of a sudden go to the other side of the mountain. You're going to be able to tell over time, like, how that change is happening. So what we're trying to look at here is the decay rate of that correlation. So we're trying to determine if we look at this heart signal, we can predict for long ranges what the heart is going to look like. So this is the actual calculation here in equation one, where n is the total number of RR intervals, so that's right here, so the total heartbeats. K is the individual heartbeat that you're looking at. Y of k is this equation right here. So it's taking one heartbeat length and subtracting the average heartbeat length. And then you're taking the sum of those over k heartbeats. So then on the next page, oops, there we go. So n is the number of heartbeats that you're looking at at one time. So the overall goal is to look at very n, so maybe look at 100 heartbeats at one time, and then look at 200 at a time, and see how this fn equation varies with that varying n. So then the y sub n of k is the value of the line of best fit. So what we're doing is this is for 100 heartbeats at a time. So your n is 100. We're taking the y of k, which is, again, the difference between one heartbeat and the average heartbeat, and the sum of those over however many heartbeats there's been. So if you were at, like, 50, it would be the sum over 50 heartbeats. And so you're doing the line of best fit from that k to that y of k, which is this line right here. And that y sub nk is the value at each k value. So at 100, it would be like around 2 up here. So then the f of n is actually the variance between yk and y sub nk. So then the final step is, again, as I mentioned previously, we're going to try to see how f of n varies when you change the number of heartbeats you're looking at. So what you do is you do a log-log plot, uh, so a log of n versus a log of fn, and you look at the slope of that line. And so here you can see data c has a slope of 0.9184, and data r has a slope of 0.6158, and these slopes tell us something. So a slope of 0 to 0.5 says that there's some sort of non-consistent power law correlation, and then a slope from 0.5 to 1 indicates that there's a long-range power law correlation, which is kind of what we're looking for. We want to be able to predict over a long period of time what's going on. And then an alpha greater than 1 means that there's a correlation that exists, but it's no longer of the power law form. So you can also <coughs> think of this as a smaller alpha value means you have a more variable system, and a higher alpha value means you have a less variable system. So here, the blue dotted line is a more variable system than the system that is shown by the red line. So then, the alpha of 1 is actually kind of the happy medium between being really variable and not so much variable. So you can see here an example of white noise, which is really messy, right? It's really hard to predict what's going on. And then this is the 1 over f noise, which corresponds to the alpha of 1. And you can start to see patterns forming in the signals. So one application, kind of like I was talking about before, is Pang et al. did a study in chaos with congestive heart failure and normal hearts. And you can see they found that the slope for a normal heart was 1, and the slope for a congestive heart failure patient was 1.3. So then if you look over here, I guess I could try to... This is the normal heart, and so because it has a slower or a smaller alpha value, that means it's more variable. So you can see like it's going up and down and up and down. But then here, the slope of 1.3, the congestive heart has a more like a less variable heart rate. So you can see that the length of that RR interval is much smaller. So then what we did is so after filtering the data and then after parsing it into the negative, neutral, positive stimulus, we ran code to do this detrended fluctuation analysis for Dr. Simonson's group. So this, these are our results. You see the participant numbers right here, 
And then this is the slope for all of the EKG signals that correspond to that negative stimulus, and then the neutral, positive, and rest. And what we found is that in the rest stimulus, there was a significant difference between low depression and high depression. So we looked at their BDI scores. And so if a patient or participant had a slope of 0 0.6097, we could say that they were likely to have low depression. And if they had a slope of 0 0.5681, they were likely to have high depression. So that's kind of cool because just like in Pang's study, which is this graph right here, just a reminder, you can take this into a clinical trial and analyze their heartbeats through a numerical method and then get a number and say, hey, this patient is likely to have depression versus not depression. So then in all, we took the signals, the messy signals right here, and filtered them. We make them clean. And then we split the data between the different stimuli. And then we used a mathematical equation to do a numerical analysis of a physical system. And that can categorize patients and participants into depressed and not depressed. So for future research, I'm actually working on this over the summer. I'm hoping to do the same thing with anxiety as well. And that's it. If this hurts your head, questions. <laughs> Um, while you're looking at this over the summer, there's a lot of research now coming out that shows that depression and cardiovascular disease are intimately related. Okay. And so treatment of cardiovascular disease actually improves depression, and, and working on depression actually improves cardiovascular disease. Okay. And so there's a lot of work that's showing a synergy right now. Um, so that may be of, of interest to you. Awesome. Thank you. So did I get this right, that the higher depressed people have more heart rate variability? Yes. Yep. Yeah, because they have a lower slope. All right, thank you.